my sisters and brothers, greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us life and showers us with his abundant grace and love. Welcome to this time of worship. We gather still in the new way of worship and gathering. We hope and believe that there will be yet a time when this this time will end and we'll again gather in in churches physically and be able to worship to see one another to to shake one each other's hands to give hugs to those of our loved ones to be back in community physically but for now your home is your place of worship your home is the place where god calls you to worship and so thank you for making the time uh, to gather in your home with all others. We may be separated by distance, but we, we are not separated by the absence of God. God joins us even when we are far apart from each other. So welcome to this time of worship. Hear the call of worship, call to worship found in Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O oh, offspring of his servants Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob lived as an alien in the land of Ham, and the Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes, whose hearts he then turned to hate his people to deal craftily with his servants. He sent his servant Moses and Aaron whom he had chosen, praise the Lord, or oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. And so we join together in singing the hymn, O oh, for a heart to praise my God. Let us join together, the words will be on the screen, so please do join in singing.
Let us now come to God in prayer. Gracious God, we adore you. We lay our hearts before you. Gracious God, we love you. Jesus, we adore you. Lay our hearts before you. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we adore you. Lay our hearts before you. Spirit, we adore you. Almighty God, from whom our lives proceed and in whom we live and move and have our being, we come into your presence today with thanksgiving and gratitude for the gift of life you have given to us. Life comes from you and we receive it. We receive it because no one else is the giver of life but you. You made us, you created us, you made us in your own image. And so you committed to be our God and you call us to be your people. And so may this time of worship we offer to you confirm that indeed we confess that you are our God, Jesus is our Lord, and the Holy Spirit is our comforter. Bring us into your presence, O gracious God. Receive our offering of worship and praise. Hear our prayers we lift up to you. Take this time as our offering to you. We recognize, O Lord, that we are not worthy. And as we so often pray, we are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same God whose mercy and love embraces us. So embrace us, Lord, even when we offer our worship. It comes not from perfect lips. It comes from not so clean hearts. It comes from not so pure thoughts. But receive us, O Lord, for in our weakness we come to you, knowing that you are our strength. In our sinfulness we come to you, knowing that you will forgive us. And so we confess our sins to you. We humble ourselves now, O God, in confession. We want to be followers of Jesus, but we do not always want to follow Jesus. We don't even want to listen when the conversation turns towards darkness and death. We prefer to indulge ourselves. We are eager to put down our crosses. We cling tightly to our lives. We grasp at worldly rewards. Holy and living God, holy and loving God, forgive all of our thoughts and our actions that would protect us from the path of Christ. Receive us now, O Lord, for we thank you that you have forgiven our sins and given us new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and Amen. And so we sing together the Lord's Prayer. We are led by the BMC Branston Methodist Church worship team who so ably lead us so many in so many services. And so we sing the Lord's Prayer.
Our lesson for today, and we have one, one lesson from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter, and reading from the 21st verse. Matthew chapter 16 and from verse 21. Listen for the Gospel of Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man has come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what he has done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. This is the gospel of Christ. We give glory to Christ our Lord. Friends, it's time to give. We thank you. We thank all who have faithfully given to the work of the church over these many months. We know many would have would love to bring their offering envelopes and, and their money and put it physically in the offering basket, but we cannot. And so we've made provision for, for you to give. The banking details appear on the screen even now as we speak, and so please take those details and you may do an, an EFT, transfer your, your gifts, your tithe and your giving into the account there is also the snap scan facility through which you may be able to give. And so we invite you to give as generously as you can. We remind you that the work of the church continues. We serve our community in the Bryanston area and also in the greater Johannesburg area, as far as Soweto and Alexander. Every week we have people coming to collect food, fruit, vegetables, bread, and whatever else we, we have to offer. And we have, on Tuesdays and Thursday, we cook meals, prepare meals for, for people who live out in the, under the bridges and in various other places around the area, virtually homeless. And so every week we offer close to 500 meals to people who need sustenance in order to continue to live. And so please do give as generously as you can for the work of God continues. This is one aspect of our work. There are many others. We prepare food parcels for a number of communities in Lanseria, in Dipslut and at Refilwe. We also continue to offer courses, marriage preparation courses, the Alpha Course and, and many others. And so your giving enables us to, to do this work. Thank you. Let us pray. Grant, O God, that what we offer to you may give life to those who are in need. May those who receive these gifts know that they come because you have inspired your people to reach out to one another. Receive and bless these gifts to your use and us to your service. Amen.
we sing the song my jesus my savior lord there is none like you let us worship together My dear friends, today's gospel lesson is usually read around the period of Lent, when we prepare ourselves to remember the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Matthew, St. Matthew and other gospel writers place this conversation between Jesus and his disciples, particularly with Peter, towards the time of Lent. Indeed, what prompted this conversation was Jesus telling his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed on the third day, and on the third day be raised. We also realize that this was the time when hostility towards Jesus from the elders, the chief priests and scribes was heightening. This is the turning point in many ways in the life and ministry of Jesus. A turning point because we see him leaving his people, the ones who should have accept, accepted him as their own, sent by God among God's people, but these people his own rejected him. Do you remember the words in the, first, the gospel according to John, the first chapter? He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. We see him moving out from among his people into the region of Tyre and Sidon, into the land of the Canaans, the Gentile land. And there we see him ministering to, to a woman and his daughter, and even commended their faith, commended a Gentile woman's faith. We see one woman recognize him as the son of David, addressing him in messianic terms, whereas his own people rejected him and regarded him as a rebel rouser. We see him traveling with his disciples through Caesarea Philippi, another Gentile area, where Peter declared him in the midst of all of those, those Gentile symbols around them, Peter declared him the Christ, the Son of the living God. All of these places were in Gentile areas. And now he seeks to go to Jerusalem, the place he knew he would not be received, nor would his ministry be recognized, where he would not be acknowledged as the Messiah, but condemned as a criminal. Credit to Peter because he too realized that Jesus wanted to venture back into enemy territory. Today we may regard Peter as foolish, as impulsive in his actions and decisions, even as a stumbling block to the ministry of our Lord. But we also have to recognize him as one who could see things as they were. Either way, can we then blame Peter for taking Jesus aside and rebuking him? No, we cannot. And Matthew makes it clear to us that this conversation happened in private. Peter took Jesus aside. And the rebuke from Peter was made in private. And even Jesus' response and his rebuke of Peter was made in private conversation. What does it teach us? What does this teach us? For me, it just means that when Jesus comes to us in rebuke, Jesus will not embarrass us. Jesus will not embarrass you in the presence of others. Jesus speaks to you, to your heart, quietly, with love, and never seek to make a public spectacle of you. Why was Jesus so harsh in rebuking Peter? Listen to his words. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine but on human things. So in order to understand these words of Jesus, we must go back a little in the Gospel according to Matthew. We must return to the lesson before this one where Jesus took his disciples, walked through Caesarea Philippi with his disciples. And it was not long before this incident that Peter recognized Jesus as the Messiah. It was not long after Jesus called Peter the rock on which he will build his church. It was not long before Peter was promised the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And not long after that, after that affirmation, that Peter is rebuked and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. The worst rebuke that could be directed at another person, Jesus directs at Peter. 
the worst rebuke that could be directed to a friend, Jesus directs this at Peter. I dare say today that this is a struggle in which many of us are caught. This is the paradox in our lives where at once we are saints, we declare Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, we are committed Christ followers and we even recognize him and proclaim him to be the Messiah. And at another level, we are sinners where we miss the mark and do and say those things that are not of heaven. At once we, like Peter, hear Jesus saying to us, Blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not revealed things to you but my Father in heaven. Yet we also hear Jesus rebuking us, for we have fallen far short of his glory. When he tells us that we set our minds not on divine things but on human things. Our lives stand firmly where Peter stood. The things of heaven are revealed to us, yet our minds are set on human things. Sometimes we are at the height of our faith and filled with love for the Lord Jesus. And at the same time, we are dragged down by doubt and we turn away from Jesus. Sometimes we live saintly lives, yet at the same time held down by our sinful selves. Sometimes we, we reach out our hands to help someone, to hold someone up, and yet at the same time, at other times, we, we use the same hands to strike someone and hurt. So often we speak words of love from our lips, words of healing and of comfort, and yet we fall back into speaking words that break and hurt. That is the paradox of our lives. But friends, I'd rather have Jesus rebuke me than be held in the clutches of the evil one. We can beat ourselves down and throw up our, our, our hands in despair, cry out in frustration that we cannot please Jesus, and maybe like Paul to say that I am woe to me. The things that I want to do, I do not do. And yet the things that I do not want to do, those I do. But I would rather have Jesus rebuke me than to be held in the clutches of the evil one. I would rather be on the fringes of discipleship than at the door of evil. I would rather follow Jesus, yes, stumbling along in my faith, missing the mark and messing up, for I know that he will not reject me. He will speak to me words that are painful. He will tell me the truth about me. He'll tell me who I am, a sinner, an instrument of the devil. Yet he will never give up on me. He will not let me go. There is a wonderful hymn we so often sing. Oh love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. When my soul is weary. When my soul is broken by my sinfulness, that love of Jesus will never let me go. Thanks be to God. He did not let go of Peter. He did not give up on him. Even when he recognized the work of the devil in him, he did not let go of him. He did not give up on him. Even when he missed the point, at the mountain top and wanted to stay there when the world was in pain. He did not give up on him. When he lost his focus as he walked on the water towards Jesus, Jesus did not let him go. Even when he denied him at his trial, he did not let him go, did not give up on him. Even when Peter deserted his post and went fishing instead. He will not let me go. He will not let you go. For his love is greater than you and I can understand. That is why I say rather be rebuked by Jesus than be in the clutches of evil. The psalmist understood these, this when he declared that a day in the courts of God is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper, he continues to say, 
in the house of God than live in the tents of wickedness. That's Psalm 84 verse 10. Friends, may I say this to you, that life in the presence of Jesus is better than life anywhere else. Yes, even when he calls you to take up your cross, life would still be better. For hear what he says, still in the gospel according to Matthew, hear what Matthew writes about Jesus. He says, his yoke is easy. His yoke, is his burden is light. He calls us and says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. How do we take up the cross? Jesus calls. If anyone wants to be my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And let us go back again to the passage before this one. We remember, may I remind you again, that Matthew records these words straight after the incident at Caesarea Philippi, where, where Peter said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. When Jesus was walking with his disciples through that ancient city, which at the time had any number of temples, it had any number of feats of amazing architecture and majestic statues to any number of gods and deities which the people had adopted and worshipped. And Jesus, in the midst of all this, asks them, Who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? Now, how does Jesus ask this question? It seemed at that time that the question was foolishness personified. Who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? It is as if Jesus is setting himself up for failure. This carpenter's son from Nazareth pits himself against the majestic gods and deities of Caesarea Philippi and even expects his followers to answer that he is greater than anyone else and everything else around them. This man, who at one time declared that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. This man expects people to say, no, you are greater than the, the majesty of the deities of Caesarea Philippi. Foolishness in all its glory, if foolishness has any glory at all. The first question, to the first question, they fumbled for answers. But to the second, Peter answers, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus' reply to Peter is, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Isn't it then amazing that at this time, the same Peter, to whom Jesus was revealed as the Messiah, tries to stop him from going to Jerusalem and die. And Jesus, who not long ago called him a rock, now calls him Satan. But the point here is that when Jesus called Peter the rock, on which he will build his church. He knew who Peter was. He knew that Peter was a bumbling, fumbling fool. He knew that Peter was, was, Peter's life was a comedy of errors. He knew that Peter was, was always putting his foot in, speaking before he even thought. He knew that Peter was frail, a frail child of dust and feeble as frail. And yet he said to me, to him, on this rock, I will build my church. You see, friends, it is not about what you bring to Jesus. It is, what, it is about what Jesus can do through you. Bring your weakness. 
Bring your failures. Bring all your errors. Bring all your sinfulness to Jesus. Because it is not about what you bring. It is about what Jesus can do and make out of you. So have courage. Have courage even when there are times of weakness in, our, in your life. For Jesus still will rebuke you, but Jesus will still love you. Now, let me now draw your attention to another of Jesus' followers who had, who had the call to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul, as you know, preached the gospel to people who were steeped in knowledge and philosophy and wisdom, people who needed things to make sense to them before they could accept them. Paul preached to the Romans, the Roman world where power and efficiency was the mark of their lives. He preached to the Greeks for whom knowledge and wisdom occupied their lives. They had great debates, philosophical debates among themselves in public places. And Paul himself, we are told, was not an, any ordinary person. We are told that he could match any Greek or Roman in debate about deep philosophical thoughts. And yet here he comes and tells them that we preach Christ crucified. Now this was foolishness at its worst for these people. How do you preach one who is crucified? How do you preach a message about a Galilean who called together a bunch of fishermen and country boys to be his disciples? How can you preach a message about the one who declared that he has no place to lay his head? How can you? How can you preach a message about a person who knew that he was going to be killed in Jerusalem and yet set his face towards the city? How can you preach about a suicidal person? How can you preach a message about the one who was hailed as a messiah and yet rode into Jerusalem on a donkey? How can you preach a message about one who, even when he was given a chance to save himself, when questioned about his status, incriminated himself by declaring that he was the king of the Jews? How can you preach a message about a person crucified on a cross like a criminal hanging between two criminals. But Paul then writes to us and says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. In his letter to the Corinthians, in the few verses we have read, we hear this theme about divine foolishness. Other statements echo the same refrain. When he writes, has God not made has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Has God not destroyed the wisdom of the wise? Or God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in this world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised to accomplish his will. And throughout the New Testament, we discover this divine foolishness, this divine madness. This divine madness was shown in the incarnation when were God, do you know any other God who actually comes down to earth as a human being to suffer pain and death? God who takes on human flesh? Do you know of anyone, of any God like that? This seems to be outright madness, but it is divine madness. Is there any other God, whose father was a woodworking carpenter and his mother a 13-year-old pregnant girl, how unbecoming of God. I mean, for a father, it could have been Alexander the Great or Socrates or Plato, the philosophers of the time. For the mother, for a mother, it could have been the Queen of Sheba, Queen Nefertiti of Egypt or Cleopatra of Rome. If God were a classic God, really? God would have chosen better parents for Jesus. Divine madness. Divine foolishness. Do you know of any other God 
who lets himself be born in a stable. How foolish, how dumb, how ridiculous. Do you know of any other God who would teach that if someone hits you on the cheek, give him the other cheek? Do you know of any other God who would say if someone takes your coat, give him all your clothing as well? Do you know of any other God who says if someone asks you to do him a favor and go a mile for them and you then should go the extra mile? Do you know of any other God who will teach that love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? You have to be a fool to take that stuff seriously. His teachings are not practical, not reasonable, not sensible at all. This sounds like divine madness. The cross itself, this God was dying on the cross. This God who endured suffering then says, forgive them for do not, they do not know what they do. Divine madness indeed, I say. Do you know of any other God who let himself be killed on a cross as a common criminal? I mean, all other gods would come down with their lightning bolts and laser beams, but killed on the cross, divine madness indeed. Even the disciples. Jesus choose, goes and chooses his disciples. What a joke they were. Jesus wanted to change the world, and he chooses fishermen, country boys, most of them, I guess, illiterate. He wanted to change the world. To change the world, I would have chosen Alexander the Great. I would have chosen a Napoleon Bonaparte type of person. I would have chosen a Hannibal type of person. But Simon Peter, a fisherman, Andrew, James, John, they probably could not even read and write. I thought God wanted to change the world. But how could he change the world with such a motley bunch of people? But what I'm suggesting to you is that at the heart of the gospel is foolishness, a divine madness, a cross-like craziness. It is foolishness to those who have not met Christ, but to those who have met him, it is indeed power. It is power indeed. Let me conclude with this story. Mark Twain writes in his book, Tom Sawyer. He writes about Tom and his girlfriend, Becky Thatcher. They became estranged, Mark Twain writes, and Becky set about snubbing Tom in every way she could. They were in the same class at school, and they had a tyrant of a teacher named Mr. Dobbins. Now, Mr. Dobbins had a book in his drawer that he kept under tight lock and key. Becky, one day, somehow managed to get her hands on the book. And as he opened it, had the misfortune of tearing it. She was terrified of the punishment she would surely get from Mr. Dobbins if, if he found out. So she put the book back, hoping that no one had seen her. But Tom saw her. Then the next day in class, the dreaded moment came when Mr. Dobbins discovered that the book was torn. Becky was frozen with fear as she watched Mr. Dobbins make his discovery. Mark Twain writes this, there was that in it which smote even the innocent with fear, the master gathering up his wrath. Then he spoke, who tore this book? There was no sound. One could have heard a pin drop. The master searched face after face for signs of guilt. The Inquisition began, writes Mark Twain. Benjamin Rogers, did you tear this book? Joseph Harper, did you? Amy Lawrence, did you? Grace Miller, did you tear this book? Susan Harper? And then the next girl was Becky Thatcher. 
Rebecca Fletcher, did you tear this book? Mark Twain writes that she sat there like a stricken rabbit and Tom, watching it all, knew that in a moment she would betray herself. A thought shot like lightning through Tom's brain. He sprang to his feet and shouted, I done it, I done it. The school stared in perplexity at this incredible folly, this foolishness. Tom stood for a moment and then he stepped forward to go to his punishment. The surprise, the gratitude, the adoration that shone upon him out of poor Becky's eyes seemed pay enough for a hundred floggings. It was foolish for Tom Sawyer to stand up and take the beating for something he had not done and on behalf of the one who had treated him so badly. But it was life for Becky Thatcher. That is why she turned to Tom with such a look of admiration. So should our surprise, so should our gratitude and more than that, our adoration of the one who stood in our place. Here again we are reminded of that wonderful hymn composed by Charles Wesley with the words, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Here was God, the Son of the living God, setting his face to Jerusalem who when we were on the verge of paying the price for our sins, rose up, stood up, stepped up to the plate and took the punishment due to us. You see, it did not make sense. The cross did not make sense. Indeed, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross does not make sense because it is driven by the love of God for the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved you that he gave Jesus Christ, his only son, to die for you. That is love. To give the only thing you have in order that someone might live. Like the story of Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher and Mr. Dobbins. Jesus stands up, rises up and takes the punishment for you and for me. The cross will always be the symbol of God's own sacrificial giving. Out of love and nothing but love. The amazing thing, if you do not already know this, is that God gave not to those who had anything good, who had done anything good, but gave to those who had done everything wrong, who gave, he gave to those who are sinners like me and like you. So, in conclusion, what is your response to such a one who stood up to take your punishment? What is your debt to him. Well, you don't owe him anything at all except your love for him. You don't owe him anything at all except your obedience to him. You don't owe anything at all to him except to hear his call, follow me, take up your cross. All you need to do is to hear him call you and hear him call you in order to restore you, to heal you, to make you whole, to give you life in all its abundance. You don't owe him anything except to give him your heart and your whole life and to sing those words, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. That's all he asks of you. May God be with you 
May God lead and guide and bless. May God grant you peace, perfect peace, which passes all understanding. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. It is too easy, O oh God, for faith to become an escape, a way to avoid the pain of being human and alive, or a path to success, a way to persuade the universe to give up, to give us the things we want, or a system of control, a way to bend others to our will. But the faith you offer is different, O oh God. The faith you offer is different, O oh Lord Jesus. It is more dangerous and compelling. It is the faith that carries the cross, that embraces death and lays itself down for the sake of others. It is the only faith that can lead us to life and resurrection, to life renewed and life overflowing and life abundant. We praise you for this faith. Oh God, now open our hearts to receive it. Amen. We now join in singing together the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God, our Father. Receive now the blessing. 
Go out into the world to join God in the work of love, of peace, of justice. Take in the breath of life. Take off your shoes. Know that you are ever in the presence of the holy and living God. Go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.